Hi, I'm Mark Loftus, editor of Post, and I'd like to welcome you to a second in a series of three podcasts sponsored by Dell Technologies. Again, I'm joined by two professionals with expertise in the space. First, I'd like to welcome back Alex Timms, who heads up business development and alliances for media and entertainment at Dell Technologies. Welcome, Alex. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. Uh, also joining us again is Jason Lowry, the CTO of Architecta, which has created its own comprehensive data management platform called MediaFlux. Welcome, Jason. Thanks, Mark. Good day, and uh, good to be back also. Great having you guys back. Uh, so not long ago, in our first episode, which was titled The Era of Data Orchestration, we defined some of the problems that media and entertainment space is facing. And I'm including a link uh, in this podcast description where uh, our listeners can go back and check out that podcast, as well as an article that Jason authored uh, describing some of those details. In today's podcast, episode two, we're going to look at the rise of metadata, global namespaces, and orchestrated workflows. And again, this podcast is going to have an accompanying uh, article that Jason is going to uh, provide for us, and that link is going to be included. I think one of the first things we probably would want to talk about are what are some of those uh, terms that we're referring to for this podcast. One of them, metadata. A lot of us are already familiar with metadata. It's information about media, information about information, really. And uh, we, I guess we're describing it as uh, the foundation of everything on which decisions are made. So that's what we're keeping in mind in this case. Global namespace, we're thinking of as heterogeneous enterprise-wide access to this said metadata. And orchestration we're looking at as the process of making insightful real-time decisions and bringing the correct data together to the right resource in as automated a manner as possible. Those are just some of the definitions that we're keeping in mind as we're addressing this topic. And uh, I guess it all refers to the creative pipeline. Jason, this is something you touched base with uh, in your article about without a pipeline, there is no creativity and you cannot create without a pipeline. Is that something maybe we want to start off with? Uh, and I don't know, Jason, if you want to take it from here or Alex, if you want to jump in. Uh, I'll jump in. Great. Jason. Uh, there's always a tension between the production of art and artists. Uh, uh, artists' creative processes and bringing some structure to that. But in um, a contemporary uh, content production pipeline, it involves a lot of people. We need both of those to be working optimally. So uh, you really can't, in this day and age, produce a product, an art for creative product, without a good pipeline and good processes. And of course, uh, without those processes, as I say, there'd be no product. So we, our, our focus is not to uh, optimize the creative process per se, but to optimize the the, the processes that happen in the, the background, the uh, automating as much as possible and remove those processes from view uh, so that the, uh, the creative process jumps to the fore. What do you think, Alex? Alex, yeah, you, you had wanted to comment on uh, why a creative pipeline is so important these days. Um, yeah, look, I think that we've got multiple people, as Jason's hinted at, that are all working towards a common goal. So, you know, if you're a single artist, maybe the pipeline is not so uh, so important. Um, you're an individual, you have your own processes. In a way, you still have your own pipeline that you're following, um, but you don't necessarily need to collaborate with others. But in a, in a modern uh, workflow, you're collaborating with hundreds, if not thousands of other people. Um, and in digital art creation, uh, regardless of what form it takes with multiple people cl collaborating or, or contributing, technology is no longer just a tool but forms the canvas on which the art is taking form. So that could be thought of as anything from the Wacom, you know, that the artist is, is using to draw, um, but it could also be consideration for the automation itself. So, uh, and it's the reason for this is that the technology must um, be what supports reduced creative friction. Um, in this collaborative process. Um, and just like a traditional artist, you know, drawing on, on uh, or painting, should I say, on an oil, uh, an oil painting on canvas, the artist will never accept, you know, the tools getting in the way of that creative expression. So it's not dissimilar in the digital world. Um, but when we talk about the pipeline being critically important, we're talking about um, 
automation, um, reducing that creative friction and allowing humans to do higher levels of work rather than focusing on repetitive uh, or mundane tasks. So we want them to come up the stack, the creative stack, and not do stuff that isn't really expressing creativity and is just a process that we could otherwise automate. I'm always curious as to where that automation comes into play. Uh, I know that, you know, when you're looking at a uh, production that has many people within one facility working with many other facilities that have different artists and specialists within it. Uh, what does that mean to for one facility automation, getting content to the next chain, next link in the chain per se? Is it readying files for them to accept it in the format that they're expecting it to be in? Is it a like okay, it's QC'd and now you're getting it the way you should be receiving it. Is it more than a delivery aspect when it comes to automation? Where does automation come into making a pipeline more efficient? You did touch on it by saying not having the artists deal with this minutia that maybe they don't need to deal with. Uh, it, it, it should be happening at every single level and opportunity. So an example of, of automation could be using an AI-based rotoscoping tool, for example, where a mask could be generated, uh, you know, to maybe 90% effectiveness, allowing the artist to focus more on compositing the shot rather than on sort of tracing out an image. Um, this is obviously a better use of their time and helps the creative process become more efficient just by doing that. But in you know, a non-linear workflow where you're always trying to place the creator at the center, um, we want to increase the output. We want to increase the efficiency of lots of people and lots of processes. Um, so it's very similar in terms of the goal um, to software development, continuous integration or agile, where small and frequent iterations are what really propels that storytelling forward. So this Automation more broadly could be a simple proxy generation process where you want to create uh, a different version of it to review in a, in a theatre. Um, it could be automatic scene building when an artist comes in in the morning to launch their uh, 3D application or applications. Uh, that is an automated process. They simply click on the department they're in, the version or the shot they're working on, and that will bring in all of those assets and build that scene so they can start working really rapidly rather than them manually spending, you know, it could be an hour for them to build that scene and bring all those assets in. So that's a really clear uh, way to improve efficiency. But you touched on this, and that ultimately this is in this new world, particularly where we've got geo-distributed, um, you know, processes and people, um, this can be all the way through to the movement, protection, deprecation, and status management of data as it moves through the pipeline. And the pipeline is no longer thought of as something that exists within the brick walls of a building where everyone's in there together. The pipeline is global. Um, and so these automation processes have needed to become a lot more complex, a lot more agile, and a lot more performant. And of course, actually, as you as you transcend organisational boundaries, or it's maybe the same organisation, as you as you move around the globe, you're now dealing with the speed of light and the people in different time zones. So we need to be able to hand off uh, from one site to another, and you need to keep track of where everything is uh, across the uh, that global space. Um, automation might not be so obvious. It may well be that I need to access a particular bit of content and as a consequence of doing that contextually the system needs to uh, automatically transmit associated content to me so that the next time i go to access it it's uh, it's accessible with low latency we used to have we've always had a requirement for uh, automation uh, in single sites uh, but as we start to expand to multiple sites uh, that becomes even more pressing. Good points. Uh, Alex, one of the things that you brought up about having these deliverables ready for the next person in line when they come in the next morning, knowing that they may be in a theater and this need this kind of deliverable. They may be in an edit room. They need this kind of deliverable. Knowing that one person has to sit there and start making all of these deliverables to get to them, that that is one way of automating it. You mentioned even using AI when it comes to rotoscoping. I know that some of the manufacturers that make those tools like the Adobe's and stuff, that stuff that they're putting into their product releases to simplify it a little bit so that time is 
better spent elsewhere and not on the more mundane stuff. Uh, I guess now, how are Dell and Architecta working together or even independently to address some of these needs that come up in a pipeline like this where automation can help these multi-point workflows? Well, the first thing is we are working together. We've collectively realized that you need the conjunction of software and hardware, um, each with their strengths uh, to, to solve this problem on a global scale. Yeah, look, I, I completely agree with that. I, I think Dell, you know, we bring to the table proven Gartner leading scale out storage. Um, you know, we've, we've been a leader in that media space for a long time. Um, architecture in this uh, more modern world where we've got those geo distributed um, pipelines, architecture adds a layer of insight and orchestration capability that ultimately supports rapid decision making, um, advanced automation and a much wider horizon of workflow options. Um, all in a validated solution. Essentially, we're we're better together. Good, Jason. Can you explain maybe how Architecta fits into the workflow? Meaning that okay, I'm a facility that has my storage. I'm working with other facilities that have their own storage. Maybe it is Dell. Maybe it's other manufacturers' solutions. Where does Architecta come in from a uh, from an installation or a licensing or what is the model there how do you actually take advantage of it if you're a facility that doesn't already have it okay so there are two ways to do this we can sit off to the side that is out of band and we can scan uh, any kind of storage presents as file object tape etc but the best uh, place for us to be positioned is in band where we are at the file system where we are the data path we're in the data path because we can see every change the the millisecond that it happens so someone uh, saves a file changes the state of it we can be transmitting it from one place to another in other words it gives us an opportunity to parallel parallelize the uh, the pipeline the data pipeline a really good example of that is you've got two sites, uh, a geo-distributed uh, workflow. Someone changes the state. They're into a certain point in their process at site A. The moment we see that for each file, those can be uh, transmitted to, to site B. Whereas traditionally what you would do is you would wait till the entire process is completed at site A and then uh, transmit uh, everything you need. So that's a sequential process. But when we're in the pipeline, it's in the data path, we can uh, uh, we can orchestrate these workflows the moment there's a trigger uh, uh, at the moment a trigger occurs and, so really mark optimally we okay. are uh, in in the data path but people often start out by putting us to the side and we can scan and start managing data so we can check in check out we can once we've got some visibility of the data, we can then put these processes on on top of, and we can reproject that data out through the front door. So even though we've scanned on an external file system or some sort of storage device, we can reproject that through another protocol uh, elsewhere. Do you find that your customers are using your solutions on a project base as opposed to a you know, perennial type of license, meaning that they're working with such and such studios in this scenario on this project, but six months ago or six months from now, they're going to be working with somebody else and the needs may change. So is it a project by project licensing agreement? Is that how, how it's deployed? Generally, what happens is people uh, either purchase software uh, and it's perpetual license or they uh, obtain an annual license. Okay. In terms of project uh, by project basis, sometimes people would like to increase the number of licenses when they've got active pro uh, projects and decrease those in quiet uh, periods. And, and depending on the customer, some customers have, have got continuously got work going. So it just becomes a steady state. One of the other advantages of uh, automation, which we should touch on, is the fact that uh, it gives us a and a way to be repeatable everything's audited we know who did what when things are forensically reconstructable and to do that you need to be able to identify everybody 
in the pipeline. So when we are in the data path, each person is an active participant in the system, in the fabric. And uh, with that, they, uh, they consume a license. So the model we have is based on concurrent user. Uh, we've, we don't care how much data people have. Um, they can have as much as they like. We're really matching ourselves to the, to the scale of an organization. And of course, we want to add value. So if we're adding value, then people will use our software more mm -hmm. uh, and they're therefore consuming licenses. So I think we're, we're matching this up so that it's a win-win for us and the customer. The thing, I don't know whether I've sort of raised it, but, you know, certainly the, you know, my career at uh, Animal Logic, um, there were some really good examples of the importance of making things atomic and tracking dependencies. So uh, the scale of that is is quite impressive where, um, you know, the Lego, looking at the Lego films, for example, the Lego brick library um, known as LDD tool was kind of, was used to make the models, you know, in three-dimensional space. But they, Animal Logic were tracking down to the individual studs on each brick. So you'd sort of go, why would you want to go to that atomic level? Well, because the director might decide that he wants to change the use of that brick type and swap it out throughout the entire film to a different type. Or the Lego Corporation may decide that they no longer want that brick used in that film. So do you then have to get every artist to recreate every single shot, um, every single frame of the film? Or do you just click a button and it automatically swaps that brick out? Well, you'd certainly want the latter. And that's the, that was a really good example of atomic automation where you want to break things down into the smallest possible parts. And it's the same, and that same sort of principle, I think, is extendable um, more broadly across pipelines uh, and a range of tools. But because the, it means that there are so many files and so many elements and so much information about that data that is required to uh, feasibly use this, that you need a very advanced system, you know, essentially a database. And I, the only other point I wanted to it's add all, is that- It's all metadata, of course, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, and realistically, you know, network file servers for, for the longest time have been one of the most potent collaboration tools. And they still are. They're the most aligned tool for media creation workflows. Why? Because essentially they're a form of a database with the tree. You know, humans are able to, and processes for that matter, are able to share that information in on collaboration storage but the limitations of that are such that you, you know you want to be able to go so much more granular um, with this and so you really need to turn to really high performance databases and automation processes to be able to track that level of granularity um, so that would be the only other thing i think i'd, I'd want to mention well actually if you look at a file system we've traditionally embedded metadata in the file system by using the directory structure to give us some context and we'll use we will name files in a certain way and with uh, uh, multiple bits of metadata stuck together to, to give us some context but it only gives you one degree of freedom you've only got one way to slice that but in a complex environment we need to be looking at this entire data space with lots of uh, slices and different perspectives from different people so we need we can't rely on the, just the simple directory uh, tree structure and file naming to encapsulate all the metadata that we need to drive these complex processes so that's exactly why you need the intersection of a file system and uh, and database uh, when those merge you can have complex metadata that drives your pipelines data pipelines and you can uh, and you can use as much metadata as you like Great. Okay. So we, we've talked about metadata here. We've talked about automation. We've talked about workflows. How about global namespaces? That's something we haven't specifically targeted here. Is that something, Jason, you'd like to uh, comment on? Yes. Thanks, Mark. A global namespace exists in two places. So at a single site, we can have a, a namespace that spans storage, all of the storage that we've got and presents that as a single uh, mount point, hides the details away. But increasingly, uh, the term global namespace refers to geo-distributed uh, workflows and geo-distributed uh, systems. And when you distribute uh, systems around the globe, you then, you're then subject to the laws of physics, that is the speed of light. And it's just not possible to instantaneously move data from one site to another or to all sites at the same time. It takes time and effort. It also costs something, we've got to actually transmit over uh, uh, 
uh, internet uh, internet fabrics that we pay for. So we need to make sure we only send the the right data at the right time. And that may actually mean that we transmit metadata ahead of actually sending the underlying data so that someone knows what's uh, available and they pull that through on demand. Or uh, due to a process or some process automation uh, pipeline, we say these 50,000 items need to be transmitted and they, that happens automatically, but not this other 150,000 items. So we, we need to embed the use of metadata in our globally distributed uh, pipelines to make sure we're just sending exactly what's needed at the right time. That that's way we can push the cost down. Yeah, that's a great point because you're talking about tons and tons of media here, huge file sizes, obviously when it comes to graphics, animation, and even camera footage, you don't wanna be pushing stuff around that doesn't need to be moved. And obviously it's more efficient to only be sending the stuff that you need to send. So knowing that through the metadata, and kind of getting in front of it is a good, good concept there. Yeah, so moreover, you don't want individuals to have to make a decision every time you need to send something. Uh, that process should be as fluid and as frictionless as possible, hence the need to automate based on context. And that context is provided by the uh, metadata. All of this is all fantastic, but the individual still needs to understand their connections and the outcomes that they want to achieve. So there's no magic bullet. There's no button you can push and it does it all for you. That's one thing that keeps coming up. There's a lot of customers that love this idea, but they, you know, even at the uh, the massive global enterprise scale, the they got to put you know, some effort in. You can't running. just magically yeah, have it happen. You, Jason, you, don't you? <laughs> yeah, you got to. You got to. Um, I've always found this in the data space. Uh, you lift the conversation, but people, and that means everybody's conversation gets lifted, and then people need to concentrate on the business process rather than the the mechanics of moving data from one system to another. They now need to think about when do they want to move that, why do they want to move it, and under what conditions do they move it? Or I'm talking about moving, but this is actually extended to the complete pipeline and automation. So that people need to put the effort in to be able to answer those questions. But we're providing systems that enable them to ask those questions and then come up with an answer. Exactly. It's allowing that thinking to come up the stack, uh, Mark. And so they're not focusing, they're not on the, the front line fighting fires. It allows them to actually come up the stack and focus on the actual business outcomes they want to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. But that can be quite confronting for a lot of customers because they haven't had to do that. So they don't actually know the right questions to ask and how to answer them in the business. Um, but, you know, that's something that, as Jason hinted at, is it can be worked through with conversation. All right. I that's a very valid point. We see that across the whole data space, not just in this area. The maturity goes up. And those people that are a bit embarrassed sometimes to not understand what their processes are. So you've got to work, you basically got to workshop this with them and uh, and just use your experience to to guide them through. But we always get there. Well, guys, I want to thank you again for participating in this podcast, uh, The Rise of Metadata, Global Namespaces, and Orchestrated Workflows. I'd like to have you back uh, for our third episode, where we're going to discuss some of the cybersecurity uh, issues that studios are facing. And I think that'll be an interesting conversation as well. So hopefully we can connect in a couple of days. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the conversation. Great speaking with you. Thanks, Mark.